pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean, the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am, uh, late on a Wednesday evening, January, I don't know, 3rd or something. Wednesday night, around midnight, because I'm still recovering from jet lag, so I figure this is the first alcohol I've had since I got back to Japan, and I thought it would be good to drink a lot of wine while I'm doing a video that I had said I wasn't going to do, but I have decided to do Sean the Book Maniac's Besties and Worsties of 2017. I was bored by the idea of doing the same kind of 2017 review that everybody else is doing, despite the fact that I'm enjoying watching many of those videos where they're ranking their best reads and worst reads of the year. That doesn't interest me in terms of my own content, so I've designed my own quirky, idiosyncratic list of awards. I hope to do it in a rather breezy and increasingly tipsy way. I'm certainly not tipsy at the beginning. Let's see how I feel by the end when I start dissing all your favorite books. <laughs> so the first category that I have come up with for my besties and worsties of 2017 is the best opening line or paragraph. And hands down, that award goes to John Boyne's The Heart's Invisible Furies. I have read this on my channel before, but it bears repeating. Long before we discovered that he had fathered two children by two different women, one in Drimaleague and one in Clonakilty, Father James Monroe stood on the altar of the Church of Our Lady, Star of the Sea, in the parish of Goline, West Cork, and denounced my mother as a whore. Maybe the best opening line ever. My next category is Sexiest Writing or Scene, and this one is a tie. The first winner is in The Tobacconist, Robert C. Toller. And there's a couple scenes in here about the young Austrian protagonist. I think he's 15 or 16 when his mom packs him up and sends him to Vienna. This is in the early days leading up to the Nazi takeover of Austria. And he works for a tobacconist and he meets this pert young teenage girl at a dance. And he's totally smitten, and she's not as smitten with him, except that there's one particular part of his anatomy that she is smitten with, his posterior. And she cannot stop talking about and touching this cute, young, 17-year-old Austrian boy's ass. <laughs> and it was, like, one of the most erotic things that I've read in 2017. So it's worth the price of the book, just for those couple of scenes, but the uh, novel itself is just wonderful. The second winner for this category is Alan Hollinghurst's novel, The Sparsholt Affair, especially the first two sections are incredibly erotic without really representing any graphic sex scenes, but just there's a hum of heiress, man-on-men sexual energy that is Alan Hollinghurst's specialty. Nobody writes about homoeroticism in fiction in the modern era better than him. And uh, wow, those first two sections are just throbbing. Like we're talking, like I, again, there's nothing pornographic, there's nothing particularly graphic, but much of the, big, the first chunk of this novel was pillow in my lap reading. Next, best cover. This one was pretty easy. Fiona Melrose's Midwinter. Wonderful novel as well, but the cover I think is just exquisite. There's no dust jacket, so it's just this... The next award is for my, my most extreme bail, and that goes to a 2017 novel called Woman Number no. 17 by Eden Lepucky, which I started, which I did on audio, and I it started out good, but it just got worse and worse, and I finally couldn't hack it anymore, and I bailed at the 93% mark. It was just devolving into two women drinking together and talking and bitching about men and art. I mean, it almost failed the Bechdel test by the end, and it started out quite strong, so 93%. Next, the book I wish I'd bailed on, and that it was easy too, Strangers on a Train by Patricia Highsmith. 
I did this for a read-along that hasn't yet materialized on the podcast, The Readers, and I just freaking hated that book. The writing was good, it's a classic, but I just hated everything about it. It was really predictable, and I hated the characters. Hated it! The next award is for my favorite character, and that is also a tie. First winner is uh, the character Turtle in this 2017 debut that's fairly controversial. My Absolute Darling by Gabriel Talent. Turtle was this young, deeply wounded and abused 14-year-old girl living with her incestuously abusive survivalist father in California. And the way that she is portrayed, I just fell in love with her and I can't stop thinking about her. The way that... Her dad's abuse and his misogyny is so deeply imprinted in her and yet there's another voice that she's doing her damnedest to coax out and the way that Gabriel Talent represented that inner conflict was some of the best writing that I've read in 2017. But that tied with my favorite memoir of 2017, Trevor Noah's Born a Crime. And I loved Trevor Noah's mum. Similar to Turtle in My Absolute Darling in that she's a survivor, but she's a grown woman and she's fiercely independent and uh, it doesn't matter what life throws at her, she bounces back. And uh, I just loved her. Next, the most loathsome character. That one's easy too. The character Emerence in the Hungarian novel published, what, 1950s, I'm not sure, called The Door by Magda Zabo. She's this old lady who everybody in the town, the Hungarian town, has hired as their housekeeper, but she's bossy and abusive, and she, this uh, writing couple hire her, and she takes over their lives, and she abuses them, and she abuses their dog, physically abuses their dog, and they put up with it, and they put up with it, and I just... I couldn't understand why anybody liked her or put up with her shit. Oh, I just couldn't. I was so happy when she died, but it was way too late. She finally died at the end when she was about 117. But oh my god, I wanted to kill her on page three. Next is the best conclusion. And I'm also giving that to Trevor Noah for Born a Crime. It's just extremely moving. There were several other contenders, but that conclusion to his memoir was pitch perfect. Uh, Next is my favorite short story, and uh, there are several contenders for this, but I've gone with one of the Mavis Gallant stories. In this 950-page collection of her stories, which I began in January and finished in December of 2017, and my very most favorite in the collection, and my very most favorite of the year, is from about 1971 called In the Tunnel. And this is a story about a young adult, a Canadian woman who leaves her widower father in British Columbia and goes off to the French Riviera to find herself. And she gets mixed up with a an older the American guy, I can't remember. But he's a bit of a playboy or certainly not a settle down and get married kind of guy. And she is so vulnerable to his wandering eye and his best friends who live down the street kind of mock her all the time. And Mavis Gallant always does such a wonderful job in capturing that sense of existential lostness. And I thought it was particularly powerful in this story. Let me read you the opening paragraph. Sarah's father was a born widower. As she had no memory of a mother, it was as though Mr. Holmes had none of a wife and had been created perpetually bereaved and knowing best. His conviction that he must act for two gave him a jocular heaviness that made the girl react for a dozen. But his jokes rode a limitless tide of concern. He thought Sarah was subjective and passionate, as small children are. She knew she was detached and could prove it. A certain kind of conversation between them was bound to run down, wind up, run down again. You are, I'm not, yes, no, you should, I won't, you'll be sorry. Between 18 and 20, Sarah kept meaning to become a psychosociologist. Life would then be a tribal village through which she would stalk, soft-footed and disguised. 
That would show him who was subjective. But she was also a natural amoureuse, as some girls were natural actresses, and she soon discovered that love refused all forms of fancy dress. In love she had to show her own face and speak in a true voice, and she was visible from all directions. Favorite conclusion to a short story. This goes to the story Hurricanes Anonymous in the collection Fortune Smiles by Adam Johnson. Hurricanes Anonymous was one of my least favorite stories in the collection, but this concluding paragraph, which is not a spoiler in any way for the story, is just stunning. This is set during, in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, and the protagonist and his young son are leaving Louisiana. Climbing the Lake Charles Bridge, Nonk can see the muscles and elbows of the petrochemical plants, their vent stacks blowing off maroon-blue flame. Below are the driven edges of a brown tide, and everywhere is the open abdomen of Louisiana. At the top of the bridge, there is no sign of what happened here. Not a sippy cup in the breakdown lane, not a little shoe. Nonk looks out on the city. It looks like one of those end times Bible paintings, where everything is large and impressive, but when you look close, in all the corners, some major shit is befalling people. Nonk shifts into fourth, and even doing that feels like a development, like it's the first step in a plot so big you can't imagine. The smallest thing now feels like a development, a turn signal. You kiss your son on the crown of his head, and no doubt, no denying, that's a serious development. You turn the ignition and drop the van in gear, and you know this is no ordinary event. You crest the lake Charles Bridge, headed west with the wind in your eyes, and even flipping down your sunglasses feels charged with forever. Wow, okay. The next award I'm giving out is for the most moving passage or scene, hands down, that's the ending to the Hearts Invisible Furies, which made me weep, or as close as Sean the Book Maniac ever gets to weeping, for personal or literary reasons, just devastated me. That's all I'm going to say. Read the book. Wow. The next award is for the most surprising scene, and that one was easy for me too. This was a memoir I read by a Saudi Arabian man about his life coming of age in the 1940s, I think, in the boonies, or would that be the doonies of Saudi Arabia? Like it wasn't in Riyadh or any place that you, any of us have ever heard of, but it was in this little town in the, I forget if it was in the north, but it was kind of off the beaten track. And one of his childhood memories is all the teenagers, when they're 12 years old or whatever, all the boys get circumcised and it's this big ritual and that was fascinating. But there's, a, I think it's his cousin, there's a young teenage girl who's sassy and saucy. And so the boys are given like a week or something to recover and they sit in the park and they sit under the tree and they're Mothers bring them food and they can just kind of relax while their wounds heal. And this sassy young Saudi girl, young teenager, one day she walks in front of them while they're all sitting in the park and she kind of lifts her skirt or whatever they wore and shimmies and uh, does the, Saudi, the 1940s Saudi Arabian <laughs> version of... A, a pole dance. I don't know what she's doing, but she does this erotic uh, shimmying before them. And of course, that I don't want to get too explicit, but that gets a rise out of them, which causes them extreme pain. And it's just this little joke that she plays on them. And I couldn't believe I was reading this in a memoir about Saudi Arabian life. And she wasn't punished. So it was just this shocking thing that I will never forget. That's a wonderful memoir. Not uh, easy to find, but please, please check it out. Did I say the title? The title is The Belt by Ahmad Abu Daman. Best audio narration. Again, a tie, Trevor Noah for Born a Crime. And the Irish actor Stephen Hogan for The Heart's Invisible Furies. His narration of the John Boyne novel was so amazing that I soon set the, the hardcover book aside 
and just listen to the audio. It was so wonderful. If you haven't read The Heart's Invisible Furies, please consider doing it on audio because it's that good. The worst audio narration, hands down, an audio recording of Mary Oliver reading her own poetry. It was my first and last exposure to Mary Oliver, but don't try Mary Oliver on audio. Her voice is like a grouchy, superannuated school teacher who's incredibly arrogant but thinks she's dispensing spiritual wisdom. Oh, it's called At Blackwater Pond. Mary Oliver reads Mary Oliver. Mary Oliver should not read Mary Oliver, and I didn't like the poetry either. What shall Sean the Book Maniac do with his one wild life? Avoid any further contact with the work of Mary Oliver, especially on audio. The next award is for the book, or in this case books, I am most likely to reread the soonest. Again, a tie. The first one is White Tears by Harry Kunzru, 2017 novel. That I know I need to reread it, and I really hope to reread it this year. Let me know if you're interested in a buddy read. Because I can't say one damn thing about it. It was about race and music and sound and it was so deeply compelling i did an audio text combo that again i can't stop thinking about it but i'm it has it rendered me completely mute a book about sound has left me mute so that 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 is one that i definitely need to reread sooner rather than later the other one is one of the last books i read in 2017 to the lighthouse by virginia wolf I can talk about it, I will talk about it, but I knew as I was reading it, heavily jet-lagged in Canada last week, or between Christmas and New Year's, that I need to reread this on a yearly basis, but I certainly need to reread it soon. Just rich. Maybe my favorite Virginia Woolf novel. Now, I need to sit with it and probably reread it before I can make that call, but wow. The next category is the best title. And that one, there's several contenders, but that one I've given to a 1979 Canadian novel that I bet none of you have ever heard of. The Sweet Second Summer of Kitty Malone by Matt Cohen. Matt Cohen died too young in 1999, and he's barely remembered now, but I went to a reading of his in the 1990s and read his novel called Nadine at around the same time, and I kind of forgot about him too. But I tracked down one of his best known novels in 2017 and just loved it. This is a set in small town Ontario and it's about the long-term common law relationship between Kitty and Pat, both of them larger than life, an incredibly tempestuous relationship, I would say downright operatic. Kitty gets very sick, and cancer, and it's how they move through that phase of their life and their relationship and beautiful writing i absolutely loved it it's cheap on kindle i would highly recommend it to you but listen to that title again the sweet second summer of kitty malone the next is for the bail that i'm most likely to try again that one was easy too late in the year i bailed on moonstone by sean and because I couldn't explain to myself or in my wrap-up video why I bailed on it, I need to give it another try. It's a short little book. I did feel it was kind of going off the rails, but I didn't give it an honest try because it certainly started out with a memorable erotic jolt. And then I just felt I wasn't sure what was going on, and uh, I bailed. I usually, if I, can, if I can explain why I bailed, I feel confident that it was a good decision, but this one I couldn't. So I will try this again. The next award is for the most surprising five-star read, and that goes to Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. I put off reading this book for decades because I was expecting that the African-American diction would be difficult to read, and I thought of it uh, to the degree that I had any idea of it. I can, it was that it would be a musty old classic, and it took me to approximately page three to realize how alive this novel is and the, the prose just sings and dances off the page. It's now my favorite American novel 
and it needs to be rescued from the canon because it's a wondrously alive piece of writing and I can't wait to read more by Zora Neale Hurston but that was a surprising five-star read. The next award is for the most surprising bail. I was really disappointed that I ended up bailing on Fiona Melrose's second novel, Johannesburg. Johannesburg was published in 2017. I believe Midwinter was published in 2016. But I read them both last year, but I, I couldn't get into Johannesburg. I thought it suffered from second novel syndrome and where her characters leapt off the page in Midwinter and the, the story was so emotionally compelling from, from the very beginning. Three chapters or so in to Johannesburg, I wasn't feeling a damn thing, so I bailed. All right, am I tipsy enough to risk booktube shunning for the next category? I'm going to protect myself by not elaborating because I'm running out of time. The next award is for popular books published in 2017, which I didn't hate, but yet, which I didn't see what all the fuss was about. Number one, Tin Man by Sarah Winman. Number two, Lincoln in the Bardo. Number three, Her Body and Other Parties by Carmen Maria Macado. And number four, Home Fire by Camilla Shamsi. Those were all two or three star reads. And again, I didn't hate them, but I thought they were highly overrated. And I, I'm in good company with most of them, but, uh, but many, many people love them, and that, that's fantastic, but I, I didn't. The next category is for the most disappointing read, and I had several, but I would choose The Sparsholt Affair by Alan Hollinghurst because it started out so brilliantly, and I was so entranced by the tight structure and the way that he propelled the narrative forward with these really mysterious plot points and the, the characterization was so erotic and spellbinding and by about halfway I felt he lost the novel the way a painter can lose a painting. Many people loved it all the way through and that's great but I was quite disappointed. Up until about the halfway point I thought this was going to be a late breaking uh, top read of the year, but uh, I thought it uh, failed at the end. just kind of went off the rails. My favorite read published in 2017, hands down, John Boyne's The Invisible Furies. I've got a full review of this and I've mentioned it already a couple times, but yeah, just amazing. My worst read published in 2017, Easy, My Cat Yugoslavia by Pajdim Statovsky. Statovsky, I think it's his debut novel, certainly it is in, translated into English. He's a Kosovar Finnish writer, and he, had, he wrote a novel which the main character is gay, a Kosovar Muslim living in Finland dealing with racism and homophobia, and as he explores his sexuality, he starts dating... Well, he has a pet boa constrictor. <laughs> He has no friends, and then he starts dating a talking cat who's racist and homophobic. Um, <laughs> it was loathsome. Now, the other half of the novel, which was about his mother and her life in Kosovo and coming to Finland, probably was a four and a half star read, but the section about the sun... Why make him so perfectly hateful? He was dull, and, and then what was this weird magical realism about the talking cat? I've been attacked on Goodreads for my scathing review a few times, so maybe I'm too stupid to have gotten it, but I didn't get it, and I freaking hated it. My favorite read of the year, another easy one, and I've talked about it a few times, and I'm not going to do a little mini review now, but A Constellation of Vital Phenomenon by Anthony Mara. I believe it was written in 2014. I read it in 2017. It's the second best novel of my whole life. It's set in Chechnya. Enough said. Best read of the year. And sorry to end on a negative night. Sorry to end on a... Okay. <laughs> Getting a little tipsy. <laughs> Happy New Year's to me. 
The worst read of 2017 was a little novella, don't remember when it was published, but within the last decade, I think, How I Became a Nun by Cesar Ira. I believe he's from Argentina, but I'm, I don't remember because I'm trying to suppress all memories of this shitty little book. I was drawn to the cover. There's the cover. A young androgynous child licking a ice, strawberry ice cream cone. See if my memory's correct once I put the picture up. And this young androgynous child is taken by her father to an ice cream shop and gets violently ill as she's eating the ice cream cone and it turns out it was l accidentally laced with cyanide. She, the kid almost dies and the father kills him. So then the dad goes to prison. And then the rest of it is their life, the, the transgender child's life with her unhappy mother and it's just horrible. I couldn't understand what was the point or it didn't have any emotional resonance for me. But oh my god, it just made me sick. So that was my worst read of 2017. So that is Sean the Book Maniac's Besties and Worsties of 2017. Feel free to steal this or make it a tag. I don't think it's worthy of being a tag, but uh, feel free to steal it, adapt it if you don't want to do the usual. 2017 review videos, but I just put it together because it was the kind of year in review that was interesting for me and hopefully for you. So, thanks for watching.